litany can be found on page 54 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. O God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy upon us. O God the Son, redeemer of the world, have mercy upon us. O God the Holy Ghost, sanctifier of the faithful, have mercy upon us. O holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, one God, have mercy upon us. Remember not, Lord, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forefathers, neither take thou vengeance of our sins. Spare us, good Lord, spare thy people, whom thou hast redeemed with thy most precious blood, and be not angry with us forever. Spare us, good Lord, from all evil and mischief, from sin, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from thy wrath, and from everlasting damnation. Good Lord, deliver us. From all blindness of heart, from pride, vainglory, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and all uncharitableness. Good Lord, deliver us. From all inordinate and sinful affections, from all the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Good Lord, deliver us. From lightning and tempest, from earthquake, fire, and flood, from plague, pestilence, and famine, from battle and murder, and from sudden death. Good Lord, deliver us. From all sedition, privy conspiracy, and rebellion, from all false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from hardness of heart, and contempt of thy word and commandment. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of thy holy incarnation, by thy holy nativity and circumcision, by thy baptism, fasting, and temptation. Good Lord, deliver us. By thine agony and bloody sweat, by thy cross and passion, by thy precious death and burial, by thy glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Ghost. Good Lord, deliver us. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment. Good Lord, deliver us. We sinners do beseech thee to hear us, O Lord God, and that it may please thee to rule and govern thy holy church universal in the right way. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee so to rule the heart of thy servant, the President of the United States, that he may above all things seek thy honor and glory. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to bless and preserve all Christian rulers and magistrates, giving them grace to execute justice and to maintain truth. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to illuminate all bishops, priests, and deacons with true knowledge and understanding of thy word, and that both by their preaching and living they may set it forth and show it accordingly. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to send forth laborers into thy harvest. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to bless and keep all thy people. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give to all nations unity, peace, and concord. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give us an heart to love and fear thee, and diligently to live after thy commandments. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give to all thy people increase of grace, to hear meekly thy word, and to receive it with pure affection, and to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to bring into the way of truth all such as have erred and are deceived. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to strengthen such as do stand, to comfort and help the weak-hearted, to raise up those who fall, and finally, to beat down Satan under our feet. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to succor, help, and comfort all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to preserve all who travel by land, by water, or by air, all women in childbirth, all sick persons, and young children, and to show thy pity upon all prisoners and captives. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to defend and provide for the fatherless children and widows, and all who are desolate and oppressed. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to have mercy upon all men, we beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give and preserve to our use the kindly fruits of the earth, so that in due time we may enjoy them. 
We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. That it may please thee to give us true repentance, to forgive us all our sins, negligences, and ignorances, and to endue us with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, to amend our lives according to thy holy word. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. Son of God, we beseech thee to hear us. Son of God, we beseech thee to hear us. O Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. O Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, hear us. O Christ, hear us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, deal not with us according to our sins. Neither reward us according to our iniquities. Let us pray. O God, merciful Father, who despises not the sighing of a contrite heart, nor the desire of such as are sorrowful, mercifully assist our prayers, which we make before thee in all our troubles and adversities, whensoever they oppress us and graciously hear us, that those evils which the craft and subtlety of the devil or man worketh against us may, by thy good providence, be brought to naught, that we, thy servants, being hurt by no persecutions, may evermore give thanks unto thee in thy holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, arise, help us, and deliver us for thy name's sake. O God, we have heard with our ears, and our fathers have declared unto us the noble works that thou didst in their days, and in the old time before them. O Lord, arise, help us, and deliver us for thine honor. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. From our enemies defend us, O Christ. Graciously look upon our afflictions. With pity behold the sorrows of our hearts. Mercifully forgive the sins of thy people. Favorably with mercy hear our prayers. O Son of David, have mercy upon us. Both now and ever vouchsafe to hear us, O Christ. Graciously hear us, O Christ. Graciously hear us, O Lord Christ. O Lord, let thy mercy be showed upon us. As we do put our trust in thee. Let us pray. We humbly beseech thee, O Father, mercifully to look upon our infirmities, and for the glory of thy name, turn from us all those evils that we most justly have deserved, and grant that in all our troubles we may put our whole trust and confidence in thy mercy, and evermore serve thee in holiness and pureness of living, to thy honor and glory, through our only mediator and advocate, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use of for their cure, and grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leadeth to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered in thy name, thou wilt grant their request. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. We begin this service on Wednesday uh, after the first Sunday of Easter 
with two of the Easter Psalms, Psalm 113 and 114, which are found on page 484 of the Book of Common Prayer. Psalms 113 and 114 on page 484. Praise the Lord, ye servants. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. The Lord's name is praised from the rising up of the sun and the going down of the same. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like to the Lord our God, that hath his dwelling so high, and yet humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and earth? He taketh up the simple out of the dust. That he may set him with the princes, even with the princes of his people. He made it the very woman to eat house, and be a joyful mother of children. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. When Israel came out of Egypt, and the house of Jacob from among the strange people, Judah was his sanctuary, and Israel his the sea saw that and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams, and the little hills like young sheep. What faileth thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? And thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back. Ye mountains, that ye skipped like rams, and ye little hills like young sheep. Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Who turned the hard rock into a standing water, and the flint stone into a springing well. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. The epistle is read from beginning in the 12th verse of the 15th chapter of the epistle of St. Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. Brethren, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then it Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that Christ did not rise, 
For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Here endeth the lesson. of the Christian teaching that were admired and accepted in the ancient world uh, by Jews and, and, and also pagan Greeks and Romans. Things like, and especially in the latter case, things like the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the immortality of the soul, the moral law of Israel, all these things found wide admiration and indeed acceptance. But the, what was not accepted was the resurrection of the dead. Modern readers often assume that in the ancient world, you know, people were less sophisticated than us, and more gullible and more credulous, and more likely to accept the idea of resurrection, that their own religion and culture would predispose them to that. But what we find among the Jews and Greeks, in fact, are the really strong objections to the very idea of resurrection. It was a very hard sell. It did not fit in with widely held ideas, religious and philosophical. 
So if the early Christians held on to the resurrection with the tenacity they did, if they held on to a belief that the Jewish and Greek world thought was absurd and ridiculous, there must have been strong reasons for them to have done so. And the historicity of the resurrection of Christ remains the best contender as an explanation for why they did. Today's Gospel lesson from St. Luke chapter 24 records the initial response of the disciples to the evidence of resurrection, the empty tomb and the witness of the women. And that response was perplexity, it was doubt, it was disbelief. The witness of the women to the other disciples seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. And though Simon Peter did go and investigate the tomb and found it empty as they said, he himself doesn't believe, but is merely amazed and perplexed wonders what this could possibly mean. Among the Jews, there was indeed an expectation of resurrection at the end of history, when God came again and set the world to right. But no one expected resurrection in the middle of time, in the middle of history, while earthly kings continued to wield their unjust rule, undisturbed by the kingdom of God. So the resurrection of Jesus doesn't fit into any pre-established narrative. It will take more than the empty tomb, or even the witness of the women, to convince the disciples. It will take Jesus himself coming to them, visible, audible, tangible. That's what will change their minds. That's what will produce in them a, a conviction of his resurrection. So we may conclude, therefore, that belief in the resurrection is not something that the disciples came up with spontaneously or easily or on their own, or that they gullibly received without adequate proof. The conviction of resurrection arose in intensely skeptical environment. That's important for us to know as a matter of historical evidence for our faith. But it also is instructive of our own spiritual lives now. If we're going to move beyond the limits of what we think is possible, what our culture has and common sense deems possible, we must embrace the possibility of an infinite power, an infinite wisdom, an infinite goodness manifested in the resurrection of Jesus. We must indeed believe. Now, for the epistle. Among the Greeks, the idea of bodily resurrection was considered absurd and, and rather tasteless, a contradiction in terms. How could a material body exist in the realm of pure spirit? How could the soul, having escaped the misery of life in the flesh, be willing to return to it? Salvation, from the Greeks' point of view, was a spiritual salvation. It was the escape of the soul from the prison of the body. Ideas very much like this are still acceptable today. The idea that though the dead are really dead and we'll never see them again, they live on in our hearts, you know, as we remember them. That's a very conventional idea, um, widely uh, uh, promoted, um, and even for many Christians, that's probably what their uh, understanding of the death of Christians is. Paul, it's very clear, is having none of that. If there is no resurrection of the body, as the Greek Christians of Corinth apparently were denying, then he says, Christ is not risen either. And if Christ is not risen, then the Christian religion falls apart. This is what he says. If Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Everything that the apostles had proclaimed and taught the Corinthians 
To believe must be worthless, empty, and delusion. And the apostles themselves must be a bunch of liars. Moreover, Paul says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If there's no resurrection, if Christ did not rise, then, he says, there is no remission of sins. There's no deliverance from the guilt and punishment of sin. And that means there's no hope of salvation for those who've died in the Christian faith. And for Christians in general, you're getting absolutely nothing in return for your faith in Christ and in the gospel. You are, as a well-known politician might say, a bunch of losers. Paul's made a pretty cogent demolition of, you might say, Christianity without resurrection. If Christ was not delivered by God from judgment and death as a sinner, to life and vindication as the righteous Messiah, then Christians should not expect that deliverance either. We are indeed still in our sins. We are still under judgment, and there is no hope of deliverance for us from judgment and from death. You can put this another way to understand the implications of Paul's argument. When a condemned prisoner gets out of prison, it's because he's done his time and paid his debt to society, his debt to justice. His freedom is a sign and a proof that justice has been satisfied. Resurrection works the same way. As Jesus took upon himself the burden of paying our debt to justice in his death on the cross, so his resurrection is also a sign that the debt is paid. But if Jesus is not raised, then his debt did not pay the debt to justice, and we are still liable for that debt, liable to judgment, wrath, and eternal separation from God, eternal death. So, if we stop believing in the resurrection of Jesus, the entire Christian faith falls apart, and Christian believing becomes pointless. Paul has taken great care to show what follows from the false premise that there is no resurrection and that Christ has not been raised. But it is the false premise. Paul moves forward to set forth the true premise. But now, he says, as a matter of fact, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. That's the true premise of Christian faith and life and hope. That's the premise that changes our past, our present, and our future. The resurrection changes our past because it delivers us from the burden of guilt for sins we've done and can never undo and never adequately atone for. Resurrection is the proof of that deliverance. The second is that the resurrection changes our present because if we're delivered from the burden of past sins, it means we are freely and fully accepted by God now into his fatherly favor and goodness, his well-beloved children. And in this confidence, and assurance, and security, we are set free from anxious self-concern, from guilt and fear, to serve him, to please him, in gratitude and love. That's just the very central motivation of the entire Christian life. And third, the resurrection changes our future. It delivers us from fear of future punishment and judgment after death. It gives us sure and certain hope in a future when our entire humanity, body and soul, and indeed, not just our humanity, but the entire creation, is not only rescued from misery, but restored to a glory which we can hardly imagine now. Resurrection is not simply earthly life 
with the unpleasant bits taken out. Resurrection is not turning the clock back to the best of your earthly life. Resurrection is an advance, a promotion to what you were always meant to be, but never were. It's the fulfillment of the promise that was never fulfilled in this life by anyone. A promise that in every life is to a greater or lesser extent blighted and broken by sin, by disease, by disability, by various corruptions of soul and body. So the resurrection is the fulfillment of the promise inherent in our humanity to become what God always meant for human beings to be. It's the promise of human life not lived in vain. In any time, this is the hope on which to build a life. But especially in these present times, may God grant us grace to believe in Christ crucified and risen for us, that believing in him, we may have life eternal in his name. Worthy is the Lamb of the slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. In our prayers this morning, we seek for grace to grasp by faith the resurrection of Christ for us, that we may know the certainty of our deliverance from sin and judgment into righteousness and favor that we may know with certainty the sure and certain hope of the resurrection which lies before us, that we may live a life that is not in vain in the Lord. I bid your prayers for the leaders of our country and state as they deal with the difficult decisions before them at this time, for those who are ministering to the sick in various capacities, putting their lives on the line in many cases, for the sick and the suffering and the dying, and for those who have departed this life in Christ. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church. Almighty and ever living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. We humbly beseech thee, most mercifully to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree the truth of thy holy word live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also, so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers, that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. To the grace of the Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, Set forth thy true and godly word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present. That with meek heart and in reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness. All the days of their life. And we must humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity.
we also bless thy holy name, for all thy servants and part of this life be thy faith and fear. Beseech thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. 